Thank you very much for the opportunity to give this series of talks. I hope you do not regret inviting me. So uh, let me try to give some context. For the first few minutes, I will recall uh, two uh, foundational results of foliation theory uh, due to Georges Hebb. Uh, the first one is Hebb local stability. It says the following, so let X be a compact real manifold and F as move codimension Q foliation on X. It's move, you can assume class C1 if you want. And let's assume that F has L, a compact leaf. With finite holonomy. Then the conclusion is that L is stable in the following sense. Then there exists an open subset of X saturated by leaves of F. Such that every leaf contained in U is compact with finite holonomy. So perhaps the picture should imagine something like this. Here you have L. So you have an open neighborhood U. And, and here inside U, uh, the leaves which touch U do not leave U and are uh, finite coverings of L. So this is the local stability, and there is the global stability. So you replace uh, Q by one, so F of codimension one. And L now is not only a leaf with compact holonomy, but it's a leaf, it's a compact leaf with finite fundamental group. Then, so the, it's the same setup as before, right? X compact and F codimension one of class C1. Then uh, every leaf of F is compact with finite fundamental group. So these are results from the 50s, which somehow uh, initiated foliation theory in modern terms. 
And it's perhaps a nice thing to say that you cannot improve uh, both results without adding further assumptions. So there is this uh, example already given by Reb, which uh, you consider x a variety of dimension n, which will be just s n minus 2. I will see this s n minus 2 contain r n minus 1 times s1 times s1. And we consider uh, coordinates x, phi, and theta. And I'm identifying Sn minus 2 with uh, the numbers with, so, so this guy is x1 plus xn minus 1 square equal 1. And so he exhibits the following co-dimension two foliation, the foliation defined by the two one form, d theta and eta two equal one minus sin theta square plus x one square d phi plus sin theta dx1. And this defines a foliation which has uh, compact leaves. So these are leaves isomorphic to Sn minus 2. So since this Sn minus 2, let's assume that n is at least uh, 4. And so this is uh, and S2 at least, so has finite, has trivial fundamental group, so has, uh, the leaf has finite holonomy. And so we can apply the local stability to guarantee that these leaves are, there are neighborhood of these leaves which are, comp, are, are saturated and formed by compact leaves. But at the same time, you have non-compact leaves, for instance, when sin of the theta equal one, uh, these are non-compact leaves. And notice that this is not only of class C1, but it's an analytic example. So it's, and y y you cannot infer just from this kind of assumptions that uh, every leaf is compact, for instance, okay? So this is just to give some context, because uh, knowing these two results, that the results that we are going to discuss today gain a lot of power, becomes uh, even more impressive. And uh, they all started with uh, the work of Darbu. So that's enough. I will not discuss smooth foliations or, or infinite foliations. From now on, we are going to place ourselves in the holomorphic category, and at the beginning, even in the algebraic category. So there is a series of three papers uh, by Darbu, uh, the first one from 78. Indeed, there are three different parts of the same paper, where uh, he proves several things, and one of the, the most celebrated results is this uh, theorem. says the following. Uh, suppose that I have uh, F, a co-dimension one foliation, on the projective space Pn. Now, of course, here I'm talking about singular holomorphic co-dimension one foliation. And uh, so there exists, I don't want to be extremely careful with the constant so that just say that there exists a number, a constant n, which depends on d, affiliation of degree d, such that if f 
admits at least n invariant algebra invariant algebraic hypersurface then f admits a first integral of the form Hi to the power lambda i, where lambda i are complex numbers, and Hi are reduced equations for the invariant algebraic hypersurfaces. It's the same. Thank you. So let me try to explain first the terms of the theorem. So, uh, foliation of degree d. is just something, is a gadget defined by uh, one form, omega, homogeneous, on Cn plus one, homogeneous one form, with coefficients of degree d plus one, uh, annihilated by the Euler vector field and integrable. So this perverse shift of the degree uh, is due to the fact that this D has a geometric interpretation and the number of tangencies of your foliation with a general line. So in this case, if you want to be coherent with the notation that uh, Enrique used this morning, so the normal bundle of F is OPN D plus two. Uh, an invariant hypersurface it's something is a hypersurface age and since it's a hypersurface of a projective space is defined by age equals zero it's a homogeneous polynomial So this is just for hypersurface, and it's invariant uh, if and only if omega wedge dh is equal to h times a theta. It's called theta h. This is a, will be a polynomial to form. So what I'm saying that when I take the wedge product of omega and the differential of the defining polynomial of H, this vanishes along H. So the tangent space of H coincides with the kernel of omega over the general point of, um, of H. Okay, and so this is the, this is the statement. And uh, any questions at this point? And the proof is very simple. Let me prove this result. Essentially, the proof is here. No, any distinct, just distinct. 
And so the proof is just the following observation. So as I said, this guy has coefficients of degree d plus 1. And this thing has degree equal to the degree of age minus 1. And this thing has degree equal to the degree of age. If I'm able to write this formula, the coefficients of theta h will have degree equal d. OK? And so uh, if I just write down all irreducible hypersurface, if I have this nd, which I will say in a moment what n is, if I write this thing down, I see that what I'm defining here is a map from Cn to uh, the space of two forms, homogeneous, two forms of degree, coefficients of degree d. And you see that, thanks to the miraculous properties of the logarithm derivative, this, this map will be a linear map, right? And so uh, if I assume that n is equal to dimension of vd plus 1, I know that this map has an element in its kernel. And an element in its kernel will be a logarithmic one form which has wedge with omega equal to zero. And so this gives exactly a first integral. Taking the exponential of this uh, logarithmic one form gives a first integral of this kind. OK? And so this, in the, this first lecture, or perhaps even in the, f in the next lecture, I, I we'll see, I would like to discuss some developments of this result, how this have been generalized to a higher dimensional, uh, to, to arbitrary compact complex manifold, and also the variations on these very simple ideas. Okay? And so this is a result that probably will be used by Simone in one of his lectures, where he will use under the name of uh, Joan de Lugis or Joan de Lugis theorem, which somehow has its origin here. But this is not only place, that's the only, not only the, that's not the only way that this result evolved. Uh, it has a lot of uh, different uh, uh, generalizations and variations on it, and I will try to discuss them. So, uh, the point is that this, this first result was later generalized by Joan Lulu, uh, which Besides putting this in a more general context, he also incorporated in its proof, in, in its statement, uh, a lemma or a result by Castelnovo de Francis, indeed the Castelnovo Enriquez de Francis, right? And uh, let me just state this theorem of Jean Dulu and try to give a proof of it.
And I was already. The Frankies, thank you. Hang on. <laughs> okay, so what's the theorem? So now it's just that X is any compact complex manifold. And uh, F is a codimension one foliation on X. So again, there exists N which will be a function of numerical data attached to f. I've just put an f, such that if f has n invariant hypersurface, invariant compact hypersurfaces, Then uh, F admits a rational first in oh a meromorphic first integral. You see, even Even in the case of the projective space, this result is slightly better than the Habu original one. Indeed, the constant here, if we specialize it to the projective space, it's not the same. It's dimension of Vd plus 2. And the argument is the, just the following. You produce two logarithmic one forms, linearly independent. No, it's of F, of F. Look, depends on the degree of the foliation. At least, yeah. It, but it's, it's not, it doesn't depend on F, depends only on numerical data attached to F. It's a number which is constant on families. So let me just remark here that when we have two, when we have, uh, if we had plus two here, I would be able to produce two logarithmic one forms, omega one, oh, eta one and eta two, which annihilate omega, and so uh, eta 1 would be equal to a multiple of eta 2. And this will be the first integral. Because when you differentiate, we have 0 equal to d eta, well, eta 2. So this is, this is the Castelnovo de Franchi's argument. Okay, so this is the statement that you want to, to explain. It's very general, but it's still very, as you see, the proof is very simple. And somehow, if, if you really try to understand the proof, it'll, it will lead to another, other, uh, another of other stuff. So this, this, the result in this way is stated by HNGs in 2000. The difference from the, the original statement of Jean Dulu is that Jean Dulu assumed the generation of Hollit spectral sequence in a certain term of Hollit spectral sequence, but then Etienne 
showed that it was not necessary. But you see, a little bit before the paper of Jean Dulou, in the paper where Bogomolov proves the boundness of leaves, he proves this thing, proves. But yeah, he gives a, a proof. He proves Seidenberg and this in just two, line, two paragraphs. But it's there. And indeed, his proof, as we will see afterwards, appears again in a more structural terms in the work of Niemann and Totaru, but we will get there. Let's, uh, let's see how, to, how the proof of Etienne goes. So the first thing, if you try to, we have to understand this proof, right? Apparently it's a one-line proof, but we have to decup it and try to understand what are the main constituents, what is happening behind there. So the first thing that is quite natural and quite easy to do when you are working on the fine space on CN plus one is to produce these logarithmic forms. So the idea here is to compare our foliation with logarithmic foliations foliation defined by logarithmic form. So we have to be able to do that. And so that's the first step. The first step is to produce these logarithm differentials. So how do we do that? So let's just set up some notation. And so let's denote by div. The subgroup formed by, generated by invariant hypersurface. by compact hypersurface, by compact uh, F invariant hypersurfaces. Uh, it, it will be even, uh, let's just consider everything with complex coefficients. I don't want to carry this over my notation. I just put it there. So div x is C divisors, subgroup of C divisors, generated by compact F invariant hypersurfaces. Okay? So if I have a divisor, or an effective divisor, I can write it will be given by an invariant a hypersurface will give, be given by uh, an open covering and local defining equations, HI. And I would like to be able to uh, write something like that. Of course I can, but the point is that this thing will not patch, they do not patch together. And if we look what is happening, if my transition functions are HIG, what you get, you see that uh, the, the obstruction to patch them together comes from this DHIJHIJ. So it becomes natural to look at the following map from div F to H1 X omega 1 X. And indeed, we would like to be able to construct a logarithmic form. And if you want to carry out this, this result, it's better that this logarithmic form to be closed. So it's natural to look at H1 of closed one forms. OK, and the map that I'm going to look is just this. And I will stand it uh, by linearity, C linearity. OK? And of course, if I have an element in this kernel, in the kernel of this map, let's denote by div zero of F, the kernel. Called psi, kernel of psi. And if I take an element in the kernel of psi, then to every element here, I can construct uh, so, I can construct a logarithmic one form. Let's put 
Let's abuse a little bit the notation and write log div f, saying that this is a logarithmic one form with poles uh, in the so with poles in the this in the in the f invariant divisors. And uh, of course, this map is not well defined. There is a certain ambiguity because when I have that uh, one guy here is mapped to zero, I resolve this cosicle, and this cosicle is not uh, uniquely determined. But what I get is something well defined mod closed one forms. Since I'm, I'm not assuming anything about my variety, my compact manifold except that it's compact, I, not every one form is closed, so I'm being more careful there. Okay, so I have a map now from this guy and this guy, and somehow this is the first line there. There is still one extra thing, is that we have to guarantee that this thing is finite dimensional. Because this is not, it's not a coherent sheave, it's, it's a C sheave. So, but if you look, at the exact sequence. This, you deduce that all cohomology groups of this guy are finite dimensional because this is coherent, so has finite dimensional cohomology, and this is topological, and my variety has finite type. And so this, all the cohomologies are finite dimensional. So all the cohomologies here are finite dimensional. So this implies that dimension of H1 x omega 1 x closed is finite dimensional. So we have, as soon as we have as many elements that we would like here, this thing will be known. I will have positive dimension here in the kernel. Okay? Now what remains to be done is to do the comparison with our original foliation F. And now we, what we can construct is the following map. We have this map from div zero. Two, uh, I'm going to take one of these, these divisors. I will consider uh, this logarithmic form. Let's abuse the notation just right like this. And then what I'm going to do is to take the wedge project, wedge product with omega. And now this will land in H zero of uh, x omega 2 x tensor nf. This will be a one form which in principle would have poles, but since the hi are invariant, this will have no poles and it will be actually a section here. Mod out uh, h omega wedge h0 x omega 1 x closed. And again, this is a finite dimensional vector space. And this is a linear map. And so if I take an element in the kernel of this thing, I have produced, I can produce a logarithmic one form which annulates the foliation. And if I have two of them, linear independent, they will differ by a meromorphic function, which will be a first integral for a foliation. Okay. So, so I take n equal to uh, equal to what? Oh my God! So dimension of h, or let's put just h one x omega one x closed plus H zero x omega two x tensor nf 
minus h0 x omega 1 x closed plus u. And if we do that, as I just explained, we can produce two logarithmic one forms, two closed logarithmic one forms, which annihilate the defining form for a, the form defining for the foliation. So this omega appearing here, I forgot to tell you, is just the one form defining f. And by producing these two one forms, I can, so there exists eta 1, eta 2, closed logarithmic one forms, uh, linear independent, independent, uh, such that omega wedge eta 1 is equal to omega wedge eta 2, which is equal to 0. And so this implies that eta 1 is equal to h times eta 2. Let's call f eta 2. And differentiation tells us that df is a first integral for eta 1, eta 2, and our original foliation, f. OK? So that's, that's the way these two the two arguments, the Castelnovo de Franches and the uh, Darbu uh, argument, are incorporated in Juan Ulu uh, and in Etienne's argument. In the Castelnovo de Franches, this after would be the maximum Exactly. That's what we are looking for, a rational first integral, except now it can have indeterminacy points is the vibration, yeah. Exactly. Okay. And so an, another comment also that's, if you see this, the proof has two parts, right? right? They have, we have this first argument to produce logarithmic one forms from uh, hypersurface. And so this, pro, this, this part of the argument where we produce logarithmic forms has nothing to do with foliations. We have divisors, we look then here. If we, we, we look at this map here, if the class here is zero, I can produce a logarithmic one form, right? And so this is what is used by Krasnov in 75 to prove that if I have a compact, complex manifold of algebraic dimension zero without meromorphic functions, it has some number, some maximal number, the dimension of this guy of compact invariant hypersurface. If I have this guy plus two, I can produce two logarithmic. This guy plus the dimension of m plus one, I can produce a lot of logarithmic one forms. We are going to find a relation between them. And you will produce meromorphic functions. So this, this argument already appears here. So this production of logarithmic differentials. Let me just perhaps state this as a Sorry? Only depends on the normal sheave of F, yeah. Wow. So let me just 
put as a corollary of the argument, indeed it, it was proved prior to that, and this is a theorem by Krasnov, uh, if X compact complex manifold of co-dimension, oh, complex complex of algebraic dimension zero, then the dimension of the group of divisors of x, I'm not taking any equivalence, not linearly equivalent to zero, nothing, just the group of divisors, is at most h1 x omega 1 x closed plus dimension of x plus 1 or plus 2. I, I'm not sure that's exactly what, uh, what Krasnov stated, but it's, of course in, it's in this flavor. Something only, an invariant only of x that you can prove, some, some, something like that. Okay, so the proof is exactly that. I produce n plus 1, dimension of x plus 1 logarithmic differentials. They cannot be algebraically independent. They have, uh, you, you have a relation, and this, the relation will appear non-constant meromorphic functions. The algebraic dimension is not zero. Okay. Well, since Carlo is not there, uh, he will not ask what happens in positive characteristic. <laughs> but I will tell you anyway. So there, there was, uh, th this result was also, th this works in, in characteristic zero. We don't need really complex numbers if we restrict to projective varieties, that argument. And uh, uh, Keen uh, provide a version of this result in positive characteristic. But very similar with what happened with Joan Lu original statement, he also had some extra assumptions. He assumed that every differential form on the variety in question was closed, and perhaps something more. But soon, uh, sometime afterwards, uh, Brunella and Nicolau proved that this assumption was not necessary. So, if we have Codimension one foliation on a variety in positive characteristic with infinitely many algebraic invariant hypersurface, then uh, the, the foliation uh, admits a, a first integral which is not a constant of derivation with non-zero differential. But I don't want to enter to that, but I, I would like to mention because somehow the history repeats itself, right? It's interesting. And there is also a version of, uh, by Serge Cantat of this result, which is a res uh, result for maps. So let me try to uh, just state it. And it says the following, so let's x uh, compact complex manifold. And phi from x to x, an endomorphism. So there exists a constant, and and now we will depend only on x, such that if uh, phi, if phi admits uh, n totally invariant hypersurfaces, then uh, phi admits a first integral. Let me explain the terms that meets the first integral. It's not a first, 
then five factors. Factors of our curve. In the following sense, in the sense that there exists a map F to a curve C and a map on the, from the curve C to itself such that uh, the eomorphism factors. So it, I have to. Uh, hmm? Maybe not clear at all. The identity does not tell this something, but you have the order. The identity does not have this property. But you have all the total invariant per surface you want, right? Oof. No, now, now the identity has this property, right? You put the identity. Do take any map and put the identity oh, downstairs. Yeah. yeah, but you're right. It's not a morphism. It's a, it's a rational map from, from X to C. And so total invariant hypersurface, I would say that. But also, the, the existence of total invariant hypersurface implies that the map, it's at least dominant, I guess. So total invariant hypersurface, the following, I say that age is total invariant. If phi star of h, it's mh. It's a multiple of h. Okay? And the game is the same. From this totally invariant hypersurface, we produce logarithmic differentials, and then we look of the action of phi on logarithmic differentials, and because of this property, you see that they will act linearly on the space of logarithmic differentials. And comparing a bunch of these logarithmic differentials, you produce this map phi. Okay. I will not give all the details. I think just want to give the flavor that these are very simple ideas which are very powerful and can be used in a lot of different situations. And I started talking about foliations, and now I'm talking about maps. There is even this result which has nothing to do with foliations or maps. And I would like to even to say, yeah, this is, is more about hypersurface, more about divisor than about foliation. So let me mention these results by Niemann and Totaro, which I find very nice. So let's now x be a compact Keller manifold. And let's assume that I have d1, d2, and d3. Uh, free disjoint effective uh, connected divisors effective connected divisors effective connected divisors with proportional chern classes Then uh, there exists a map F from X to a curve C. There exists F non-constant such that FDI are points. So these three disjoint divisors 
with proportional chain classes are fibers, are different fibers of a fibration. As a matter of fact, the, this result, uh, yeah, no. But. And as you see, these are, again, uh, very close to uh, the, the discussion that we were having. So how the proof of this thing goes? The point is that uh, Hodge index theorem implies that these guys, I can, since they are proportional and I'm only looking at divisors, I can just reduce without loss of generality that they're just equal. I'm not saying that the revisors are reduced. I'm just saying that they are effective. So I just can assume that these turn classes are equal. And in this case, the Hodge index theorem says that D1 is numerically equivalent to D2, is which numerically equivalent to D3. OK? And so I can look at D1 minus D2. And this D1 minus D2, when I look at that map from div x to h1 x omega 1 x that I considered before, just forget the closeness because now we are in the compact Keller world and this is not very important. The DD bar lemma says that it, we can get rid of without it. Uh, so this says that this map is going to zero. So this is just the churn class map. Since this is the chain class map and this guy goes to zero, I can produce uh, eta, a logarithmic one form. With poles on D1 and D2. And since we are on the Keller word, we can do it slightly better. We can indeed pr pr produce, take care to, to produce this logarithmic form such a way that uh, it has, we can assume, assume that the periods of eta are totally imaginary. Why is that? The point is that we are in the Keller world. And I am looking at this line bundle, which is a line bundle with numerical equivalent to zero. And of course, this line bundle comes with a section. The section is just the section which has zeros in D1 and poles in D2, or the other way around. No. I look at the associated line bundle. OXD, and I look to the chain class of that. Uh, uh, uh. Rational, rational values. Doesn't, doesn't make a big difference. Re uh, yeah, we can get rid of torsion. Don't have to worry about torsion. <laughs> and, uh, and so this guy has zero chain class. And since we are in the Keller world, it admits a unique flat unitary connection. And as was already explained to you, if I have a connection on line bundle, I have a foliation on the total space of the line bundle defined by the horizontal sections of the, the connection. And I can pull back this foliation using the rational section or the meromorphic section that I have. And this is eta. OK? And so here we have our, our divisor D1. And I have the divisor D2. They are both disjoint and have proportional chain classes, and I have produced this foliation. 
a foliation with uh, purely imaginary periods. If, since it has purely imaginary periods, it admits a real first integral. You just take the norm of the exponential of a primitive of eta. And this will define tubes around these guys. And the foliation will be tangent to these tubes. So this is the norm of the exponential of a period of eta. Okay? Very good. And I did that for d1 minus d2, and I can do that for d1 minus d3. Right? And so I have d3, which is in the middle here. And uh, I can do the same for d3. And a simple reasoning with the maximal principle allows you to compare these two foliations, the one associated to d1 minus d2 and the other associated to d1 minus d3, to conclude that these two foliations are the same. So again, we have two logarithmic differentials which differ by a meromorphic function. And so you can repeat the argument of Castelnovo de Franquis and uh, conclude. But okay. conclude that you'll produce the first integral. But this, is what, this was not the original argument of, uh, of Totaru or Niemann, or even it's something very similar to that appeared in the Bogomolov paper. I will want to give to, to explain this other argument, which is also which is very nice. So let me, since I want just to, 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 to uh, convey the, the, the key idea, let me avoid any kind of technical subtlety by assuming that these three divisors are just smooth hypersurface, which are disjoint, right? And so the point is just the following. So you have, the idea is, is the following. So you have... Uh, from X, you have a natural map to uh, the Albanese variety of X. There is one trivial case, right? If D1 minus D2 is linearly equivalent to zero, we are done. We have a map to P1 and it's trivial to see that D3 we're going to map. So if it's not linear equivalent to zero, it's because the Albanese variety is non-trivial. So we have a non-trivial map here. Okay? And the thing is that I have, for instance, D2 uh, minus D3, which is a divisor numerically equivalent to zero, but when I restrict it to D1, since this is disjoint from D2 to D3, this is trivial. So the thing that you can do is to, uh, so we are just producing, I have this guide, which I'm assuming which is not trivial, otherwise I would already have my map to P1, and I'm assuming that when I restrict to D1, it's zero. So you have that this map from H1X, OX, to H1, D1, OD1, is not injective. Since this is not injective, this map is also not injective by uh, hard symmetry. And since this map is not injective, when I dualize it, it will not subjective. So I have that this map, it's not subjective. And I can go to the quotient. And now, this map now contracts D1. And since D1 has numerically trivial normal bundle, it must contract the other guys also. 
And so this is uh, the, 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 this also is another way to, to phrase this. It, it essentially, it's the same argument, but well, phrase it somehow differently. And so this is the, the argument which appeared uh, the first time I, I learned this argument in a paper by Totaru. But apparently he was inspired by uh, this argument from Niemann. But something like five or years after that, I discovered that this argument was already in this paper of Bogomolov, there in the half a line or something. Uh, and the, yeah, perhaps next time I will think about, I will try to uh, discuss a generalization of this Juan Lu theorem that I, I did with, uh, with Carlos Spicer, but perhaps I will talk about something else, let's see. And I would like to finish by mentioning that there is a very interesting result by Bell, Moza, and Topas who uh, somehow put in, formulate a, a more general statement which includes both Kanta uh, and uh, Joan Lulu theorem in a common statement, a more general thing. Uh, it's, on the, it's only on the algebraic category, but it's, it's interesting. Uh, but uh, this people, I think they come from model theory and somehow this Jean Lou's kind of result interested people to normal, a normal theory, model theory, but I'm completely incompetent on that. I will not say anything more. Okay, thank you. <laughs>